Okay, welcome to the uh, North Puget Sound Chapter uh, Career Advancement Program for, or for 2014. Um, this program here got started about 11 years ago. And the reason it got started was that for the past 30 years or so, we've been having the land surveyors refresher course for the guys that are going to sit for the LS test. And so a bunch of us LSs were sitting around and talking about it and talking about a lot of the complaints that we had heard over the years. And one of the complaints is that a lot of the refresher classes started right at the beginning and uh, just went on right from the basics and most of the guys sitting in these classes I already know that stuff. What I want to know is uh, some of the more complex, more advanced stuff that I'm going to see on the LS test. So we said, okay, uh, why don't we work up some sort of a course for the field people and the office techs that haven't had a formal education, like Renton Tech here, uh, they haven't had formal schooling. They're basically doing on-the-job training, which I have no problem with. That's how I started. But in a lot of cases, the field people are being told which buttons to push on the machine, which monuments to pick up. There's no, they're not given any independent thought of their own. They're not given any uh, a training to actually solve the problems out in the field themselves. They're not given the foundation, the basis of what is happening. Uh, whether it's what they're actually being doing, why, why, why they're being told to do this, or what's going on in the machine. So we said, okay, let's think of uh, some things that are really basic to the surveying industry, mainly for the field tech, also for the office tech, to <clears throat> understand what's coming in uh, from the field data. So we came up with a uh, uh, 12 classes that were to be run concurrent with the refresher classes. We wanted to have them kind of the uh, same time so that uh, there may be a possibility of you guys mingling with the guys sitting for the LSs. And for a long period of time, we did do that. We had the classes on the same night, same facilities, so, you know, there were groups of people wandering back and forth. It was a good way for you guys to see prospective uh, employers. But we thought, you know, instead of just throwing out stuff, we'd try to come up with classes that kind of were linear that would lead up to a grand finale. And uh, <clears throat> that's what we had, that's what we came up with. We were not intending this to be an LSIT refresher or prep class. At that time, there were no LSIT tests. It was fairly new. And so what we wanted to do is set up a course that would give you a basis of what you're getting into, what you've already gotten into, why you're doing it, and instead of giving you full, complete instruction each, you know, Thursday night, have you totally cover the one subject that, that uh, we're covering, is that we're giving you enough to point you in the proper direction so you can start doing your own study. Uh, you can uh, decide which seminars you want to go to or uh, books that you need. And uh, more importantly, we wanted to show you <coughs> what the foundation was to uh, enable you to start looking around for a mentor. And the LSs that we got together and the ones that I've talked to are more than happy <clears throat> to take you under their wing and tell you and guide you and help you with what you're doing. Uh, that's uh, very much unlike when I was a young tad your party chief kept the notes close to his vest there and because you were going to take his job. Nowadays, the one thing I really like about the LSA, LSAW is it's stressing education, not just for the LSs, but for 
guys coming up through the ranks. And it's very important that we stress that, particularly now, because uh, we have the great majority of the licensed surveyors who look like me. You know, no hair, gray hair, getting ready to retire. I've been retired for 10 years. And right now, I believe it's 60 percent of the licensed surveyors in the state are 55 years or older. So there's going to be a big huge gap here in licensed surveyors in a short period of time. So we want to make sure that we've got people coming up. And that's you guys. Just by uh, the fact that you're sitting here, that's you guys. So <clears throat> that's what we're here for. Is we want to try and uh, get you guided, get you pointed in the right direction, give you a good foundation. So that's that's what we're doing here. Um, what we've got, and <clears throat> I'll tell you what you're getting into. Uh, this is the class schedule. You've probably seen that online. Uh, what we have is <clears throat> basic math one. That's tonight, and that's me. And. Uh, when I talk about basic math, I'm talking basic math. We're going back to what I know best, pencil and paper. That's how I grew up, no calculators. Slide rule was the brand new thing. Man, it was difficult to use. So complicated, you know, high tech. Uh, but we're going to be doing it pencil and paper. And I was mentioned earlier, you will probably never use what we're going to learn tonight in every day. You're not going to use it. However, you will probably see it on tests. I don't know if you're going to see it on the LSIT, but on the, the uh, PLS test, definitely. I was mentioning earlier, uh, in fact, on those downloads, if you get the, the uh, last set of problems there, it looks like a traverse. That's, that's an actual problem. They give you uh, the beginning of a traverse, coordinates, bearings, distances, angles turned, and then you'll get to a certain point and they say, your calculator just went dead. Do this problem. And it's usually a, like a 10 or 15 point problem. It's a biggie. So that's where you're going to use this. And if nothing else, if it helps you do that problem on the test, this is worth it, I think. <clears throat> Okay, uh, basic math two <clears throat> continues this, and whereas basic math one is uh, focused primarily on triangles, in particular uh, right triangles, <clears throat> the uh, basic math two is horizontal curves, and together with the uh, right triangle and horizontal curves. If you're very comfortable with those, you can do 95% of the math that we do on a daily basis. The rest of it, the rest of it is, uh, you know, uh, solid geometry is what they used to call it, but spherical geometry, stuff that would be uh, dealing with uh, you know, GPS calculations. And uh, for any of you that have actually gone into some of that, locating, doing star shots, sun shots, and any of the math involved in that. You're still doing triangles. However, what you're doing is using a curved triangle up there. And the thing about that is the interior angles do, do not add up to 180. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next, boundary calculation by Martin Paquette. Martin is one of the two instructors here at Renton Tech. And uh, this is not exactly what you might think it is, is sitting down and doing math again. He's applying the math that you will be using in the field to actually doing boundary. <clears throat> Picking up the proper monuments um, and doing the proper calculations. And if you're being sent out into the field to pick up the four corners of a block, and picking up those monuments and tie them in there, you may be doing it wrong. And that's one of the things he's going to cover and tell you about. Um, 
Now, the one thing about this here is, uh, as far as the instructors go, you guys are pretty lucky. There's uh, <clears throat> four surveyors of the year and uh, two past presidents, state past presidents there. So make use of it, you know, talk to the guys. Uh, all of us welcome you emailing us or calling us, uh, just contacting us if you got questions, anything. So we're here to, to help you. Although you should be getting your own mentor and having him drive you and help you. Okay, <clears throat> survey field notes. That's me again. And that actually happened to be the one class that all of us, when we were planning this, uh, agreed on <clears throat> that should be taught. Uh, you know, some companies do not use paper field notes. I don't think there were any of us that really agreed with that. Uh, and once we get into that, you'll find out that the field notes are extremely important because they are a semi-legal document. They're what's going to go to court. And if you know how to prepare them correctly, uh, you're going to be a lifesaver. Okay, settlement monitoring is uh, <clears throat> also another subject that's that's really interesting. Ben Peterson is probably the king of tunnels in the state of Washington. Uh, he did the bus, bus tunnel down at Westlake Mall. And he has a nice presentation on uh, what it takes to do actual monitoring of uh, dams and buildings, excavations. And it's more than just running levels. Uh, if you think that's what it's been, what it's all about is just running a level to the site seeing if anything moves, that's not settlement monitoring. <clears throat> and in particular, his, his class here uh, can actually make you the hero of your company. It can, make, it can save your company from lawsuits. And it's that much different from just running levels. The uh, state plane coordinates by uh, Martin. Uh, you're not going to be doing any calculations using state plan coordinates. It's going to go through the basis of it from the beginning to the end, and it should just boil down to one really simple, uh, actually two simple little equations that uh, will hold you instead in doing uh, state plan coordinates. That's coming more and more into play with uh, using the uh, GPS and uh, larger projects. Again, when I was a kid, young surveyor, uh, <coughs> we tried to stay away from the state plane coordinates. They're too long of a number. You know? Remember, we're doing this with pencil and paper. There's no way I wanted to start doing my math with numbers like that. So a lot of it was assumed, 5,000, 5,000 for your northern and eastern a lot easier to work with. Uh, positional tolerance. Now that's a scary uh, subject to me. <clears throat> I don't really like math. Uh, and this, uh, Mark Harrison, will show you how using all statistical math uh, is really not that scary. And again, you're not going to be doing a lot of calculations. You're just getting the concept of it, knowing what it's about. And again, in the end, he'll kind of sum it up very simply. So he does a really good job of it. Uh, the introductions to the GLO surveys, <clears throat> that is uh, one class where Buck Harrison, who works for the city of Bellevue, uh, will take you right from when it was all dirt on up through the beginning and give you a good grasp of what the public land survey system is all about and how to work with it. Uh, I know when I first came up here, uh, came out of California after doing eight years with the Division of Highways doing road construction. I had no idea about boundaries and such. When I got a, a quarter section map, I'm, looking at the roads along here, and I'm wondering, you know, where's, where's all the information? 
because the plans I work with, you know, the, the 24 by 36 plans, you know, here's the roadway width here, and all this stuff was written inside of it. Boundary maps, no, the right of way, you had the right of way there, and then the rest of it was all property, and here's section corners. I had very little introduction to sections at that time. <clears throat> No class due to the LSAW con conference. Are any of you guys planning on going? Are you able to go? Oh. I'm kind of familiar with it, but I don't know what it's about. Okay, well, once a year, uh, the land surveyors put on a conference, a three, three day, three and a half day course. Uh, all sorts of speakers come up. There's different sessions. There's exhibitors showing all the new equipment and everything. And uh, <clears throat> it's mainly for a lot of the surveyors to get together. One, do some networking. Also, uh, it's a way of them getting their continuing education units. Uh, that's something that, uh, that the LSAW actually enacted was uh, getting continuing education part of the law. And so this way you've got surveyors have to keep updating themselves on the laws, on what's new in the, in the world of surveying, and the conference is one way of doing it. Um, so I don't know, some, some of your employers will allow the, the field people and office techs to go. Um, if, you know, if you can go, uh, see me. Because right now I'm <clears throat> scheduling the volunteers that help out with classes, etc. So you get to go for free as far as registration goes. Where would it be at? Uh, the Tulalip uh, yes. Resort. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, riparian boundaries. <clears throat> uh, that's very important in the state of Washington because. Uh, there are so many boundaries that are uh, defined by water, whether it's tidal waters, uh, lakes, uh, rivers, whatever. That's what's kind of unique about the state of Washington. So we are a, a riparian state. And that means that the uh, certain portions of uh, land relative to certain bodies of water can be under private ownership. And so there's a lot of rules and regulations as to how that occurs. And uh, Jim Cohen, who was uh, an instructor here at uh, Red Tech for 23 years, will be doing that. He's got a good presentation on that. Um, construction staking by Tracy Tim. Tracy uh, has spent his whole career uh, either with the uh, DOT or where he is right now with Pierce County in survey. So uh, they'll start talking to you about construction. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, you know, break right in on him and ask the questions because that's the kind of a class this would be. Is uh, uh, here's some methods. Got questions? Let's examine this method, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, the BLM Manual, uh, 2009. Uh, <clears throat> the BLM Manual is considered the Bible for surveyors. It was written for a government surveyors to deal with uh, setting the original government mons or retracing them and resetting them. However, it happens that so many private surveyors run into situations where you have to replace or recover that monument, that quarter section monument, section monument. And so that's what you refer to as the BLM manual. And uh, actually in uh, GLO, uh, Buck will go over all of the different list of different instructions throughout history that have been given as far as uh, whether it's just called instructions of 1780 or, or if they're the uh, 
BLM Manual 1947 or BLM Manual 1973, or currently BLM Manual 2009. So Jim will go over that, give you an idea of what's involved in it, <coughs> primarily what you guys as beginners ought to be looking at. And then lastly, legal descriptions. <coughs> Pretty much everything that you've done here leads right up to get doing the legal descriptions, understanding them, getting prepared to write them. Mainly in your case, it's understanding them, being able to read them, and uh, being able to take those out in the field and with independent analysis be able to start picking up what you need. This, this is the, the, the one thing that I think is going to help you the most, uh, at least in your advancement in your career. Because when we drop back to that, you're just punching the buttons, you're just being told what monuments to pick up. <coughs> That doesn't do any justice for you at all. I mean, you're not advancing your career, you're not advancing your knowledge. Once you're able to understand that, all this other stuff falls into place. So, that's who you've got and what we're going to be doing over the next 12 weeks. Okay. <coughs> now, as a uh, beginning surveyor, you really ought to start building your own library. And these are, uh, this is my list. You've got LSs at your office that have different lists. They have different books that they consider of uh, importance. But this is, uh, this is kind of the ones that I recommend here. Okay, we just talked about the Manual of Surveying Instructions, the 2009. And uh, that's the current one. The previous one was 1973. And that's uh, the one that was current while I was doing most of my survey. The one before that is 1947. And if you ever run across a copy of that, grab a hold of it. Because things change just a little bit each time. The 47 has an uh, orange cover. But uh, I don't have a copy of the <clears throat> 2009, but uh, there's a couple places you can get it. You can either go to the BLM um, website and, uh, or to the NSPS store, go to the e-store, and uh, you'll find them there available for sale. I uh, believe, let's see, <coughs> oh, okay, yeah, I did say it. This is online now. You might be able to find some hard copies, but uh, you could, if you want to, print out the PDF of the 73 manual and uh, use it for comparisons. Jim will start giving you some of the comparisons, so, so uh, that may not be you know, an issue at this time. Uh, <coughs> Now, the one thing about the NSPS store is that since NSPS, everybody know what NSPS is? National Society of Professional Surveyors. It, uh, it took over from ACSM, which was the American Congress of Surveying Mapping. Uh, ACSM, for the longest time, was the big wig in the federal uh, or national arena. And uh, they did have a very good bookstore. They had a lot of different items. In fact, these items were, I say, Amazon. They had all those uh, books in there, plus many, many more for surveyors. Since the NSPS took it over, they're really limited as far as the publications that they have. So a lot of the stuff that was available before, you might have to look around. but. Here's some of the ones that uh, you should probably have. Definitely have the 2009 manual. That's one of the things that you guys right now should have. Uh, <clears throat> this one here, the Washington State Common, Jerry Broadus' book. That's this guy here. 
And it's a replacement for a book called uh, the Municipal Report Number 14. And that was an excellent book because what it was was several surveyors got together and they went through all of the laws, all the RCWs, all the WACs, pulled out everything that was relative to surveying, land development, <clears throat> anything that had to do with surveying, and then start putting it in the book. Now they didn't just put it in there and say, okay, here's this uh, RCW and you know, you're just reading the legal uh, text on it. <clears throat> But they started uh, explaining it, giving good examples, nice sketches. And the Report 14 was just an easy read, especially for beginners, to understand about surveying in the state of Washington. And unfortunately, a, uh, it's not in print anymore. However, I have a PDF copy. If anybody wants one, email me. I can't sell it to you. I'll just, uh, if it's small enough to email, I'll email it out to you. Otherwise, I'll get it out to you somehow. But it's a good thing to go through and read, but understand that it's an old publication, and so much of that stuff may be outdated. And so this actually has the updated uh, wax and, and requirements in it. Uh, but the Report 14 will let you settle in and feel comfortable with starting to read all of this stuff so you can progress on to something that's a little more technical. So if you, uh, if you want it, just let me know and I'll email it out. <coughs> so this, maybe later, uh, think about the Report 14 now. The Highway Engineering Field Tables, that's the Red Book. And this is, uh, this is exceptional also. It's, all, it's got all sorts of tables in it, natural function tables. It's got formulas for different uh, figures, areas, uh, different methods of, uh, of running uh, surveys. It uh, shows you like I'm going to show you tonight, how did you pencil and paper traverses, how to balance those traverses with pencil and paper. We're not going to cover that tonight, but you know, with this book, uh, you'll be able to do that. It's pretty much dedicated to pencil and paper work, although you certainly apply your calculator to it. Uh, I, I'm not going to say anything about it. Um, but uh, uh, take a look through it when you get it and find that uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that you hadn't even thought about. Uh, maybe even just one little paragraph on, on something that maybe you had a question about as far as the basics of what you're doing. So uh, this is an excellent book to have. When I was <coughs> with the Division of Highways in California, we had the same thing. It was about three quarter that size, a hardcover, and it fit right in the pocket. And so uh, that was that was what we used all the time. So that's definitely one. And you did then, say uh, we're gonna get one, right? Yeah. Sometime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime. It's up to the state printing office. Okay. Um, and the last one that I think you should definitely have is the definitions of surveying and associated terms. Mainly because if you can go into a test and you're allowed to take some books, you take this one. Because it does, it's just a dictionary and it's got pretty much every, every uh, term associated with surveying in it. And uh, I recall that uh, there was a question that asked, uh, what is a dip needle? And then it was multiple choice. What is a dip needle? Anybody know what a dip needle is? No, neither had I. However, it's in here. <coughs> yeah. 
dip needle is used, it's kind of like dowsing. It's, it's just a little gizmo, kind of like a compass or so. When you carry it around, the needle will drop whenever you run over metal. It's a batteryless metal detector. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, so those are the ones I think you guys should have. Again, talk to your LS, talk to your mentor, find out if he thinks at this stage you guys should have something else. You know, everybody talks, well, yeah, let's get Black's Law Dictionary. Well, you guys don't need that right now. You know, as an LS, yeah, it's a good idea to have that in your library. Um, this guy here, the uh, Construction Surveying and Layout uh, by Wesley Crawford is, is very good. It's very, very basic, easy to read, and it covers just about everything in going out and staking out stuff. Um, he used to write an article or a series of articles for POB, and each one of them was on some sort of construction staking and, and simple construction staking problems. And, uh, <coughs> but he doesn't do that anymore. Now, one thing about uh, this, uh, this one here is uh, it used to have a price of like 40 bucks on it or less. Now you go to Amazon and the price is all over the place. They're, they're starting to treat these things like actual textbooks. And so with the AS, AS, ACSM uh, bookstore, you got a good deal on it. So, <clears throat> I've just got Amazon down there. Uh, you guys might have to start looking around and see if there are supply houses that still have some of these things. If not, a good substitute is going back to here. <clears throat> and when you start going down the list of the publications they've got, you'll see construction manual. That's all it says, construction manual. It's the Highway Construction Manual. You can get a PDF copy of that for free. And so take a look at it, and it's, it's, it's an excellent uh, book on manual on uh, uh, construction staking also. It covers all sorts of things. So that one's free. You know, it just costs you the paper to print it out. <coughs> Waterfront titles. Um, yeah, that's on the that's on the LSAW website in the, in the store, and you can print that out also. It's a PDF file. Um, you, well, I guess you could actually consider that the fifth book that you should get. Uh, again, it used to be printed out in just a little booklet like that, but again, it's uh, it easily describes all about the aquatic lands, the riparian boundaries, got lots of nice pictures to illustrate, uh, and it's a, it's a good thing to have. Uh, you might even want to get it before you come to the riparian class so that uh, when he starts talking about some of the stuff, uh, you've got an idea of what he's talking about. But you can just go to the LSAW site and go into the uh, bookstore, and you've got to go to uh, resources. It's down at the bottom of the page. <clears throat> Just print it out. Okay, now this here is just, uh, you probably should have a good survey book, a good general surveying, math, everything else book. Uh, what I think this is what uh, the class is using right now. Been using that for a couple of years. Uh, I like Moffat and Bossler. Uh, if you get the older editions, uh, that's the 10th edition. I'm not too sure about that, but I just I have a copy of the 6th edition at home. And the thing about that, it, it has the natural function tables in it. I, I haven't seen any of these. Uh, surveying books that, <coughs> that actually have the tables in it. So this one <coughs> excuse me, would uh, 
help you if you don't wind up with any other manual or book that's got tables in it. Okay, and uh, writing legal descriptions. Once we get into the uh, <coughs> last class, the legal descriptions, uh, I don't know if Jim will recommend it. He probably will, but what we're talking about Waddles, the yellow book, because Waddles has written uh, several others, this is the definitive legal descriptions book. Covers just about everything you want to know about how to write a legal, how to read it. All the little ins and outs, the in intricacies of it. So, this isn't something you need right away, but keep it in mind. And then here we have the LSAW reference manual. And that is <coughs> nothing but all the RCWs and the wax together, crammed together. Really dry reading, but it covers everything. And uh, when you're going in for the LS test, not the LSIT, if you can take that copy in, uh, usually they'll want you to uh, quote your source, show your work, quote your source. And so, since you don't have Report 14 and it's outdated, you would have to use that. Say, okay, I know where that is, and go there and be able to read off the RCW and quote it out. It's just a, an extra book to take in, but it's a good, good reference source. You know, it's, it's the horse's mouth on, on the logs. Okay. Now, the one thing that uh, is not on this list, and one thing that I do recommend that you guys have is some little peg book, something like this. Uh, you know, you've got, this is from Sokia, you can get them from Geoline, get them from a, uh, just about every distributor, <coughs> and they're little teeny field books. And a lot of times they have formulas on the inside, conversion rates, you know, some, some little information in it. But <coughs> what uh, you can use it for is if there's some formulas that you might wind up using rather than just punching buttons, go ahead and write them down in here and keep them. Uh, anything that, any little uh, rules of thumb that you run across, write it in there. Uh, and that's what I used to have was a little peg book. It's by yay long, yay wide, and flipped open. You can stick it in your back pocket and you can put a sheath of uh, note paper in there. So I just took notes. But on the inside of that, I cheated. I started writing in ink on the inside covers all the little formulas I was using, things that I'd have to look at each time. All right, going uphill, slope reduction. God, do I use sine or cosine? No, still have to draw a little picture. So uh, it's, it's just something kind of handy to, to jog your memory and help you out. And it's not cheating. If you got a little cramming, peg book of some sort, that's not cheating to, to use that. Uh, it's also not cheating to get together with your party chief or your uh, crew member and work out the problems. You, know, you don't say just because the party chief is getting paid more, he's got to sit there and do everything by himself. You don't want to do that. You want to do it right along with him. That's how you learn. <coughs> okay, those are uh, some of the books, some of the ones that I recommend. Again, talk to your uh, talk to your party chief, talk to your LS, talk to whoever is going to be your mentor. Find out what they recommend. But start building yourself a library. And uh, if you think, "Wow, man, that's a lot of books. I can't read them all here," you can actually get a stack of books at least this thick. Put them in the bathroom. Just spend a couple minutes reading a couple pages. You'll definitely have gone through that in about six months. And it's not a big, big, hard chore. You don't have to sit down and keep going through it and going through it. All right, surveying. As I mentioned, <clears throat> most of what we do on a daily basis is triangles. That's what we're calculating with. Um, 
pretty much everything using the uh, traverse, inverse, resection, intersection. These are all based on triangles. And uh, not much more than that. Maybe some horizontal curves. <coughs> but uh, you've got a lot of different triangles here. And, uh, you know, they've got the different names, mainly because of the way they're shaped here. Um, and with these guys here, uh, you're going to need, uh, there are formulas that go along with each and every one of these. And what you need on uh, these guys are, uh, well, just at least on these guys here, you're going to need three pieces of information. You're either going to need two angles and the included side, or you're going to need a side and, and the side and the included angle. And then you're going to be using law of sines, cosines. Uh, <coughs> you may even have a triangle where you're given three sides to start calculating from. But you know, you're starting to talk about holding different things in your in your brain here. Like I say, there's there's these basic triangles here, and then you've got some special triangles here, three, four, five. 30, 60, 90. Well, these kind of things start telling us that, you know, there's there's a relationship in these triangles. There's something about these guys that uh, really is kind of solid. They're not floating around here. You know, like this triangle here, you can take this point here and move it out there and then move this up there and then that down there. Still have a triangle, but Man, it's just all over the place. <clears throat> but with the, these guys here, they're kind of fixed. There's something very special about that that we'll get into. But there's uh, math involved. And so to get into the world of triangles, I think we ought to just start getting into it. So uh, without further ado. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you've got books that, that have got pages of this stuff here when you're trying to work through math. No, no, forget it. Forget it here. Uh, you don't need all of that stuff. What you need, again, for everyday basic surveying is a right triangle. That's it. You just need the right triangle. But you say, oh, what about... Okay, these guys here, they're not right triangles. These guys are here, they're right triangles. The beauty of the right triangle is that's fixed. So, whereas these guys, you could stretch all three and be all over the place, you can only stretch that and that because this is set in place. That's 90 degrees. It's, it's nailed to the floor. Okay, so with these, you only need two pieces of it information. You need an angle and a side. That's all you need. And from there you can start calculating, figuring out the rest of the triangle. Say, okay, well what about these guys here? <clears throat> um, I say I don't like math. I flunked trig in high school. Uh, I didn't learn it until I got in the army and uh, they showed me how to use trig to drop steel on the bad guys, and that made sense to me. Good hands-on application. But uh, <clears throat> so I concentrated just on the right triangle. Tried to learn that and, and get that set solid in my mind, get comfortable with that. And I started looking at these guys here, and I said, well, you know what? If I extend this line out here and drop a perpendicular to that, I've got a great big right triangle. And since I've got three pieces of information here and I only need two for a right triangle, I can start working on this and basically start working a big right triangle and have some information where I can start solving the little triangle. It's longer, I mean it takes more time than than remembering or having the formula just to go through the law of sines, cosines. But 
it is simpler here. It is, uh, if you just concentrate on using the right triangle. Same thing here. You just drop that perpendicular down there. You've got two right triangles. So you can start thinking things that way if you're really adverse to math like I am. Um, someone said that math is man's way of explaining the world around him. Well, even as a teenager, I just kind of walked around with my head in the clouds there, cotton up there. So maybe that's why math didn't take. <clears throat> Okay, most of you guys have had this so far, right? Are you comfortable with the right triangles? Okay, well, all right. I said this was a basic math, so you're going to have to bear with me here because we're going to go over it. Um, you'll see it the way I see it. Okay, the triangle is really a nice figure because it does have fixed relationships. And uh, so if one thing changes, these other things are going to change in a specific manner. So it's not, okay, you've got an angle in here. I have no idea what's going to go on. You know, we change something here. I don't know what's going to happen here. Because if something happens, if you've got an angle in here, there's only certain things that can happen to the rest of the triangle. And you start thinking of it that way, and you know that starts feeling a little more comfortable. It's not a real big unknown here. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, it has relationships here. So what we want to do first is label it, give these things a name. So the, the uh, capital letters are going to be opposite. Uh, related to angles here. So this angle would be A, this would be B, this would be C. You can flop this around, turn it upside down. You could call this one A, this one B, but this one will always be C. <coughs> 90 degrees. So that labeled that way is just for right now. It can move around. Now the sides that uh, if you had a gun and you were sitting there and you just shot it, you know, shot it here, shot it there, shot it there, the side that it hit is going to be the lowercase letter. So bang, shoot off there, there's the lowercase letter that's side C. And also D there. So you've got the angles relative to a specific side. So again, here's some relationships, just by giving them a name. Okay, now, there's uh, <clears throat> certain names that we're going to apply to to these guys in here, so that we can establish even more relationships. And when we've got a relationship between two sides, we're going to get a, a number, kind of a fractional number here, not fractional, decimal. But just dealing with sides, you're going to come up with something that we're going to call either sine, cosine, tangent, etc. And dealing with the sides here, this thing that we call a sine is created by dividing the side opposite by the hypotenuse. Side C is the hypotenuse. Okay, you say side opposite. Well, that can apply either to this guy here or this guy here. Depending on, and we're going to get into that, depending on you making a choice as to where you're going to start your calculations. Are you going to start it with the angle at A or are you going to start with the angle at B? <clears throat> so, once you decide that, if you decide you're going to start with angle B, then this is the side opposite. This is the side adjacent to it. If you start with A, then this will be the side opposite. This will be the side adjacent. This is always the hypotenuse. Okay, so you've got a relationship. So 
this number here, sine. <clears throat> Don't worry about what it is right now. We're just talking about the relationship between these, all these things here. So, whenever you divide the side opposite, let's, let's start with A here. Whenever you divide this side, the length of this side, by the length of this side, you're going to come up with a number that is called the sine, the sine of this guy. It's the angles that have functions to them, the sine function, or the tangent function, or the cosine function. Not the sides, it's the angles. So, the sine of A, that's how we could write it, sine of A equals to uh, dividing the hypotenuse by side A, or the opposite. And so, the cosine, here's another name, is uh, the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. So, if we start looking at uh, this angle here, we decided that we're going to uh, start with that angle, or if that's the only angle that we're given, then this is the side adjacent. We can say, okay, <coughs> I can use, when I divide this by this, I get a number that is called the cosine. And jump ahead, you can look right there, you can see the tables have columns listed, sine, cosine, tangent. <coughs> so those numbers there are what we're talking about when we divide these sides. Okay, the results of uh, the tangent function is the opposite divided by the adjacent. So we're not dealing with the hypotenuse at all. So it looks like we pretty much covered uh, every situation for any given information that we have. Remember, we only have, have to have two pieces of information, uh, an angle and a side, primarily. So with those guys here, we can continue to calculate the rest of this triangle. And the reason for wanting to calculate the rest of the that's what I never got in high school. All right, just go ahead and do it. Why? Well, this is the basis of running a traverse. That's it. We're going to get to that. But that's it. That's why you're going to do it. That's why you want to find out all this stuff here. Because that's how you can run a traverse, start calculating. Okay, so up here, <clears throat> um, I've just shown you, you picked which, which one you wanted to use, either the sine of A or the sine of B. You've uh, either been given or you decide to use this angle or this angle with the information you've got. Well, then you can just copy this down here. <clears throat> sine of A equals uh, A over C. And these are just things that you can write down in that little sketchbook if you need. And that's that's what uh, that's certainly what I did. Okay, so <clears throat> we've uh, we've named this guy, and we've shown kind of how the relationships are, um, and we've said why we need to do it. Are there any questions on this? Anybody? Right now is a good time. To jump in with any questions. I was, I never got to a point where I could figure a good question to ask. <laughs> I was totally lost, so. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, the right triangle, very, very important. Like I say, with this and uh, the uh, uh, horizontal curve, you can do about 95% of the calcs that you need to do out in the field. Okay, we're just going to, before we jump on into the rest of it here, you want to kind of develop things that you should know. These are kind of rules of thumbs. So these are some of these things that you want to put down in your, your little peg book, your little carry-along book there. <clears throat> things you should know. Well, obviously, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Uh, it's a good thing to know. It can be used 
a lot. <coughs> and uh, one minute equals three hundredths in a hundred feet. That should be a little hundredths marker there. Have you got an idea of what that means? One minute equals three hundredths in a hundred feet. All right. Yeah. yeah. You know. Okay. All right. Because I've got another story that goes along with it. What that means is uh, you're looking down line. All right. And uh, you're you're uh, you're about a, a minute off. Somehow in error, you think you're on the right spot but you're actually a minute away from where you should be. Okay, one minute. Well, if you're looking out 100 feet and you're that one minute off, <clears throat> you're gonna be 300 off of where you should be. One minute is 300 of error in 100 feet. <clears throat> and so that just kind of gives you an idea. Okay, I'm looking out there 500 feet and I'm a minute off, well then I'm, what am I, 300 times 5, 1,500, I'm that far off line. <clears throat> so that's kind of a, a real quick rule of thumb that you can use to kind of guesstimate. And one of the reasons for that is, I don't know how often I've had data come in and Guys have spent so much time trying to get down to the nearest second, <clears throat> and they're 200 feet away from something, and the thing that they're shooting is this big. You don't need to do that. What are you saying? So the more distant, let's say 200, so come to the 600 off, right? Uh, well, the farther out you go, you just multiply that 100 by uh, 3. Okay, if that 200, then it should be 600. Then 600 off, yeah, yeah. Um, again, these guys here, they're, they're back to my day when we had pencil and paper and we couldn't do a lot of complex uh, calculations. We wanted to keep it where we could do a lot of the stuff in our head. <clears throat> now, where this came from, at least I've been told, and it's a real good story, is uh, from Napoleon's artillery. He was king of the artillery. And uh, uh, when he brought his artillery in, they had the forward observers out there, the guys that were uh, ranging the fire out there and uh, calling back the adjustments. Well, they used the metric system. <clears throat> And their circles were divided not into degrees, minutes, and seconds, but into mils. And you had 6,400 mils in a circle. So it was kind of like reading an azimuth. You just had numbers ran right on up. So they had determined that they're looking down line, they're shooting down line, and uh, say that at 100 feet, excuse me, no, at a thousand meters, if they were one mil off line, they were one meter off line. So it was still kind of the same relationship. They could they could gauge, you know, and the guy'd say, okay, we're looking at a target that's a thousand meters away, and uh, oh man, you guys missed it by ten meters. Well you're crank your gun back ten mils, because you had the dial on there. Crank it back 10 mils, refire, <clears throat> gonna be right on target. So again, this was no big calculator problem. It's done right up in your right in your head. <clears throat> uh, it's a good one to remember, cosine of one degree, three nines eight five. Um, and then also the square root of two. Those are just real quick, easy things to remember. Um, this cosine thing here. Nowadays, you know, we sit up on a hill and we look out a half a mile and just spray everything in. Uh, not the way it used to be and not the way that a lot of guys want their property uh, surveyed. A lot of people say, I want that line cleared. I want you to go right on down line. And actually, we're not doing 
plants too many too much anymore, but that was always a good thing to do right at the beginning is run your clearing line down your property and actually run right down property, clearing the line. Then you could find out if there was any encroachments there. Okay, and you wanted to find that out right in the beginning so that you could uh, dump the problem on the engineer <coughs> or the landowner. But if you hit an obstacle there, instead of just saying, okay, I'm sitting here, let me calculate up coordinates here and, and throw a traverse point out here and come up, recalculate coordinates, try and come back here. It was pretty simple here. <coughs> you looked online and you turned an even degree. One degree, ten degrees, twenty degrees. It didn't make any difference. Just something that you could remember. Again, you didn't need to write this down any place. As long as you could remember it from the time you walked from there over to here, that was cool. So, you turn an even number of degrees, in this case we're saying one, and then you measured out along that line a specific number of feet. In here we're saying we want 100 feet. Set a point there. Okay, then you can pick up and set there, and from there turn twice what you turned here. So here you're going to turn two degrees. And that gives you another side of a triangle. And if you measure back the same distance that you measured out to this point, you're back on line. And then turn your one degree back here, and you're looking on line. Flop the scope, head on out. <coughs> so that was pretty easy to, uh, to remember. No calculations involved. You just remembered what angle you turned, what distance you went. And in this case here, if you went 100 feet, cosine of 1 degree here, uh, by your 100, this leg out here in a right triangle <coughs> would be 99.985. And then the other side would be 99.985. So your overall distance, 199.97. And so pretty quick easy way to remember things like that. So little rules of thumb that were pretty, pretty simple. Okay, uh, the square root of two. If you're laying out a corner, building corners, you want to be, I don't know, you've still got people that spray out the building corners. Not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. You really, and I'm sorry, what I tell you tonight <coughs> particularly in this and in keeping notes, I don't want you to go back to your office and say, well, Vic said to do it this way. No, you do it the way that your boss tells you to do it. But here's what I would do in this situation. Setting up the building corners, I'd set here and uh, measure that there. I, obviously, I may have sprayed in this corner and this corner. Then what I would do is set up on one shoot the distance, measure the distance, do any adjustment that I needed to do, and had myself a good solid line there. Well, in that case, all I need to do is set the temporary point there, and then maybe set a 10-foot offset straight on down that line. I can plot the scope, set 10-foot down that line. I could actually pick up then, and the uh, <coughs> chainman could take his pocket tape, Hook it on the, the uh, tack there, uh, check that 10 feet, and then uh, set his pocket tape, uh, tape on, on that nail and swing an arc in the dirt, 1440, 10 times the square root of 2. And from here, pull out 10 feet, swing an arc there where they crossed. That should give him a good 10 foot offset at 90 degrees. Of course, double check that. So, while he's doing that, you can, you know, you probably have shot something down here, but uh, he could be doing something while you're moving ahead. <clears throat> so, little shortcuts or checks. You may stay up on all these corners and 
turn your angles and uh, measure up 10 feet, 10 feet with the gun both ways, but you'd still, you know, do your diagonal check of 14, 14. So it's something easy to use. If you had a 20 foot offset, 28, 28. Let's see, where are we? Oh yeah, okay, this, uh, there's a lot of text there, but it really is pretty simple here. This is just an example of going through the process of calculating sine A equals A, uh, sine A divided by C. Well, here we are, we're given, or we maybe even measured that angle. Maybe it was given to us somehow, or maybe we actually measured that angle. Yeah. And we measured this distance here. So we've got the angle A, we want to get the sine of A and use it with the distance measured because then we've got two numbers that we can multiply or divide together. <clears throat> so sine A, and I'll tell you what, take a look on your table there and uh, look under the sine column. Well, first up top, there's uh, two big columns there, 26 degrees and 27 degrees. You guys see that right at the top of the page? Okay, so look in the column for 27 degrees and pick the sine column. So that's the first one on the right <coughs> under uh, 27. Slide your finger down to 42. Okay, what's that number? Oh, it's this one here? 0.46. That's what it should be. Okay. So, so that's it. That's, that's what you're using those tables for. You're able just to say, okay, this is what I'm going to be turning or measuring, and I know I'm going to be using the sine column. I, maybe I was going to use the cosine column. That's the thing for you to decide which ones you're going to use. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, go through the process that you know, is identified here. And so what that does is it gives you side A, because that's the unknown. So side A then is 71.19 feet. And you're going to need these two decimal numbers to work with. So this is the minute column. That's the minutes column, yeah, on the very right-hand side of the, under the signs. <clears throat> That's pretty easy, so we don't need to do any more, do we? You got your book there. I just showed you how to use it. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, let's do uh, 27 degrees, 42 minutes, 17 seconds. Go ahead. Run your finger down there and find that. Okay, <laughs> it's not there. That's going to be the process that we're going through, is figuring out how to calculate the seconds portions of this. <clears throat> uh, there may be times where you don't need to actually calculate the seconds in the situation you're in, and you can just you can just use those tables. Hopefully, on the uh, on the test, any test, they'll just give it to you for the minutes. So. All you need to do is pull that out. Okay, I'm ready to go. <clears throat> but if you're involved with using the seconds on the end, then you've got to start doing some interpolation. Okay. Um, now, I always had a problem with remembering, uh, you know, what do I do with the, the sines and the cosine? I'm trying to remember the process here. And so that's what these are here, is uh, if the unknown is on the top of the equation, actually if that was A divided by C, that way, you know, A is on the top, C is on the bottom. <clears throat> if the unknown is on the top, then multiply the two knowns. And that's what we did. A was our unknown side that we were trying to calculate for. It was on the top of that equation. 
So then we multiplied the two knowns. The other known was this guy here, the length. So we had the sine times the length, which gave us the other side there. Okay, we still there? Still good? Okay. If the unknown is on the bottom, then divide the known side by the natural function. So, what would that be? Okay, that's still the top and the bottom. That one there may not be that common. Since you're going to be making your choice, just say, okay, I'm going to have my unknown always on the top of the equation, whether it's going to have to be sine or cosine, if it's angle B or angle A, you're going to make that choice to make it as simple as possible here. And you say, well, God, you know, there's nothing, nothing here at B. I want to do that, so <clears throat> this would be on top, so I could use that. Well. That's why right triangles are so easy. You've got 90 degrees, 27, 42. What's this one? One thing about the triangles, interior angles always add up to 180 degrees. So always. 90 minus 27, 42. Yeah, these two added together, subtracted from 180. And that gives you that guy there. Okay. So, even without getting into this stuff here, you've got two angles, three angles in one side. So, even without going through the process of figuring out the sides and the cosines, what do I do with it? You've solved another piece of this triangle, which what it does is gives you more options rather than just saying I only have to do my calcs using that, I can make the choice between these two, which ones I want to use. <coughs> Numbers will still come out. <coughs> okay, so that just kind of gives you an idea there. Um, and your red book kind of covers, covers this stuff more, uh, a little more detail. Okay, now, natural functions from there, it can be read directly from the tables in the book. So it's uh, unlike having to uh, use the calculator functions 2742 and uh, wind up having to wind up uh, decimalizing and undecimalizing here. These numbers that you read out of there, you just plop right into a formula where you're going to multiply or divide. You don't have to do anything else with the sine and cosine functions of those. Those, those are the numbers that you're going to work in your formulas. Make them easy to multiply and divide with. Okay, once all the sides are solved, you can use a squared plus b squared equals c squared to check yourself. That's what you want to do is always check, check, and double check. So hopefully you're starting to see that this really isn't as complex as I thought it first was. Maybe you didn't. I did. <clears throat> and then I finally find out it's not that complex. Um, now if you use a calculator in here, you do have to use your decimal function. HMS or whatever, DMS, whatever, unless they do it automatically now, don't know. But that would have to be decimalized, put into a decimalized function. <clears throat> if you don't have the calculator, again, like that Traverse program, and, and your calculator's dead, and you need to decimalize something, uh, you wouldn't need to do it if you're using the book there. But if you need to decimalize something here, Okay, here's the process by doing it by hand. And this is kind of uh, a neat thing to know. And so you've got the handouts there, so you've got that too. Um, to decimalize 27, 45, first step 
this isn't going to change. Your degrees is not going to change at all. What's going to get decimalized is your minutes and your seconds because you can always think of in any way this has got a decimal point after it. So it's 27 point something. Right? So the first thing you do is take the minutes divided by 60. 60, uh, 60 minutes in a degree. That gives you this number here. Then second step is taking the seconds divided by 3600 gives you that number there. Okay, then your final answer is going to be 27 degrees plus this guy plus this guy gives you the decimalized number for 27 3246. <coughs> okay, if you're going to undecimalize it, we're going to take that same number and just take the decimalized number times 60 and that gives you 32 point something, the decimalized number. Well, 32, yeah, that's that second place there, that's easy. Then we take that remainder times 60 gives us 45. So thus we come back to 27, 32, 45. Why is it the A? The, the first number eight, we got 32 seconds instead of minute. Uh, that's 32 minutes. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm, I can actually pull this up and scratch it out on the whiteboard, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good point. It's 32 minutes, one little hash. I'm old. I need my glasses for everything. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a neat thing to have. I don't know how often it'll show up, if it shows up in tests or not, but, you know, it's kind of a neat thing to have. Uh, these guys, this guy here, you've got the handout, so, you know, if you need to go over and over it again, that's fine. All right. <clears throat> Just so that you can appreciate your calculators and your electronic methods of calculation here, this is uh, how natural functions can be calculated by pencil and paper. It's called the Taylor series. And so we've got our natural functions here. These are the primary, the sine, tangent, and secant. And the reciprocal is the cos cosecant of the side, cotangent of the tangent, cosine of the secant. Well, the reciprocal is 1 divided by the function. That is, you know, the sine, 1 divided by the sine gives you the cosecant. So they're, so they're functions, reverse functions. They're related to each other. Okay? Um, so that means that you really don't need to calculate each and every one of these because it's going to be a real pain. <clears throat> so you don't need to calculate these reciprocals at all. So you're just looking at three different functions here, sine, tangent, and we're going to use cosine here because that fits in with uh, our triangle, our right triangle. Uh, we don't even need the tangent because tangent equals the sine divided by the cosine. Just accept this, I did. There's no way I'm going to go try and do a proof on this here. Well, that looks good. It works out when I use it in the calculator. <coughs> okay. Calculate the natural functions using the Taylor series. First, we have to convert the degrees to radians. So, uh, x degrees divided by 180 times pi will give you radians. I'm not going to get into radians right now. Someone else will explain it to you. Uh, but for this, this is how they went about this process. Instead of just using 23 degrees, um, 
they converted it all to radians. So they had 23 degrees divided by 180 equals this number here. <clears throat> so then that number times pi equals that number, which is 23 degrees expressed in radians. All right, so the Taylor series, the, uh, you're looking for the sine function. You're going to calculate the sine function of 23 degrees. Well, x is the radians. So this is just a matter of plugging in some numbers. <clears throat> so once we have that, we have x minus x cubed. So this minus this cubed. Go ahead, you want to even do that by pencil? Pencil and paper, just that step? OK. Once you've got that, then that's divided by 3 factorial. Anybody remember what a factorial is? Okay, that's the uh, that's the uh, number in a series times itself. Essentially, it's three times two times one. That is three factorial. Eight factorial would be eight times seven times six times uh, five times four times three times two times one. That's what the factorial is. You start with the number and then multiply it by all those other numbers going down. Plus, this number raised to the fifth power divided by 5 factorial minus this number, radians, raised to the seventh power divided by 7 factorial. Can you imagine doing that? pencil and paper just to get the sign of 23 when you can look on that sheet or just punch it into the calculator? Yeah, yeah. Now, for all I know, that's, that's what's in your calculator. That may be the way that it calculates it, because it certainly doesn't store all those tables. <clears throat> Maybe it calculates each time by doing this. I can see that. Cosine is uh, just another function there, another series. But uh, that's to let you appreciate the instrumentation that you've got. Now, somebody had to work that out. That's, that's incredible. You know, that's so far beyond me. But there were other ways of surveying and calculating and working things out. Things called an astrolabe. <clears throat> and this was just a piece of equipment. And what's kind of neat is just Google it. Look it up on Google and you'll see all sorts of images. These things were produced as pieces of art. Not only a, a, a good uh, uh, scientific instrument, but it did all sorts of things. It told time. Uh, gave you direction, uh, sunrise, sunset. Uh, Muslims used it to tell where east was. You could, uh, you could navigate with it. It was even used to survey uh, Babylon with. So uh, what I've got, I'll let you kind of pass it around. This is a real cheap, cheap model of it. But they used it by holding it up and then there was a sight on it. And they just kind of hold it up in sight at a particular object. And then uh, they could do some calculations from it. Really simple. But that was it. This is how it was used. And on the back is what I'm particularly interested in is this stuff here. See that's on the back there. <coughs> And this is a reproduction of one that looks a lot better. I'll pass that around. But you can see it's got a lot of line work on it. These things actually have line work on it. I think that was made by some kid that was sitting in a mud puddle and put it together. But this one is uh, actually pretty good. 
uh, I used this to uh, try and tell some time, and I was within three minutes just using this guy here, paper. So these were incredible pieces of equipment. And what it, what it really used <coughs> was uh, this shadow square here. And it dealt with holding a pole up and measuring the length of the shadow. And where the shadow or whatever would cross here, you could uh, measure these or check these little graduations, do a little real quick little multiplication or division. And you could start calculating heights and lengths. Actually, you could calculate two sides of a right triangle. So, this guy here was a little short video that kind of explained that. And unfortunately, I put everything on a different flash drive, and I forgot to put the audio files on there. So I'll, uh, I'll do that next week, and, and you can kind of see it. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> all right. So all of that is kind of leading up to what we're actually going to do tonight and start figuring out how to run a traverse using pencil and paper. So. This is what we're going to start with. This is where we are, and this is where we're going to take a break. So come on back about uh, um, 10 till, and be prepared to be amazed.